Hey, Dave Ferrari here, and this is the story of a little display layout I built for many trains in Germany. The display was built to show off the new line of HON30 mini trains. These trains are all based on the cartoons of Karl Fallberg. Fallberg's cartoons appeared in Railroad Magazine during the 1940s and 1950s and have been assembled into a book available from Heimberger House. It's a 144-page softbound book and it's available from Heimberger House Publishing Company. The cartoons tell the story of the Fiddletown and Copperopolis, a rundown railroad that ran through Eastern California. Fallberg was a Disney illustrator and then a TV cartoon writer. The Fiddletown and Copperopolis is a fictional narrow gauge uncommon carrier based on Colorado's three foot Rio Grande Southern and California's Carson and Colorado. My research consisted of looking at the cartoons again and again. I made notes, copied pages, drew sketches, and tried to absorb the things that made the fictional railroad unique. I made a list of features and details, as I wanted to incorporate as many as possible. First, I built a half-inch scale concept model. It's a model of a model to work out the possible scenery combinations before I started actual construction. Once many trains approved the concept model, I started construction. The first thing I did was to make a frame of one inch by three inch pine. I braced it and then I routed the top inner edge to hold a sheet of half inch thick black gator board. The gator board was the base for the bottom and top tracks. Gator board is lightweight, strong, and waterproof. It can be cut and shaped using hand tools. The bottom track bed was a loop of one inch styrofoam. This raised the lower track level to allow a water feature at each end of the display to run under the tracks. The upper track was laid directly on gator board. Risers were cut from gator board to support the top piece. The risers were placed so they didn't interfere with the lower track. All exposed wood was painted with several coats of a dark forest green. Both loops are Pico HON30 flex track, attached to the styrofoam and gator board using double-sided carpet tape. All joints were soldered and feeder wires attached. I ran the trains for several hours to make sure that the track was perfect. Once the track was in, I covered it with blue painter's tape and started landform construction. The scenery was built from beadboard and scenic express urethane foam rocks. It just so happened that I received a piece of furniture packed in foam the day before I started the scenery and some of the foam had broken and the pieces looked perfect for the little buttes that rise above the town. I stacked the beadboard to get the contours and these were held in place using liquid nails and bamboo skewers. The skewers kept everything aligned until the liquid nails had set. The four tunnel portals were made from Scenic Express foam stone wall sections and pieces of beadboard. The tunnels and the retaining walls were set into place using liquid nails and pins. The pins held the walls, sometimes at unusual angles until the liquid nails had set. The retaining walls are urethane foam pieces from Scenic Express. These were glued and then held in place with pins and clamps. When the glue dried, I carved and shaped them to fit the contours using a hobby knife. After the hobby knife, the beadboard pieces were carved and shaped with a wire brush. This makes a big mess. So I held the nozzle of a shop vac next to the brush while I carved and shaped the foam. Some of the shapes were made using a hot wire cutter. I also covered several areas with plaster wrap to smooth out the contours. 
When the shapes looked good, I painted all the exposed foam with a thin coat of white acrylic gesso. The gesso seals the foam and provides a base for painting. Next came the rocks. I modified all the Scenic Express foam rocks by running them through a bandsaw to make the thinnest possible cross section. I mixed a batch of sculpta mold and troweled it on where I wanted the rock faces. Then I pushed the rock pieces into it. The sculpta mold is the cement that holds the rock pieces in place. The excess sculpta mold that squeezed out from under the rock pieces was either blended into the surrounding scenery or removed with a wet brush. After all the rocks were in place, the remaining scenery was shaped and textured using sculpta mold applied with a stiff bristle brush. Several times during scene reconstruction, I cleaned off the area where the town would go and I placed all the structures in the scene. What I was doing was experimenting with their placement. I wanted to find an arrangement that pleased me. After the scenery shapes were almost finished, I gave everything a coat of scenery black to seal and homogenize the scene. Scenery black is made by mixing one pot flat black with two pots of your earth colored paint. It makes a nice beige coat that seals everything up and gives you a base to paint over. Here all the major landforms are complete, but something about all of it bothered me. I was unhappy with the way the buttes looked, so I sawed the tops off three of them and replaced the tops with a piece of beadboard to represent the lava cone or center of the butte. It also gave the scenery the illusion of height without actually getting much taller. The rock style and colors I was looking for was based on photos I gathered from the internet. The first step in coloring the scenery is painting it with a reddish earth color. This is called underpainting. And what it is, it's the base color for all the rest of the scenery. I made the reddish earth color by mixing my earth colored flat indoor wall paint, which is a match for floquil earth, with a red rock powder from Arizona Rock and Mineral. This underpainting is dark and will provide the shadows when lighter colors are brushed over it. I mix several custom desert colors using my earth color as a base. There was a light orange, a red, a purplish red, and a sienna. I used both tube acrylics and rock powders to get the colors needed for dry brushing over the painted base. I printed several photos of real rocks found in the area of Eastern California and Western Colorado to use as a color match. When I mixed the color, I painted it directly onto the picture and then made modifications to the color to get a perfect match. I also used acrylic titanium white for dry brushing the rock surfaces. I was telling John Olson about the project and he sent me a dozen bags of different colored rock and soil samples he had gathered on his travels in the desert. I used these around rock formations and structures to provide unique soil colors and textures. I tried several structure arrangements before I settled on the one you see in the photo. I wanted the structures in the rear to go uphill, so I used pieces of quarter inch foam core to raise them. At the bottom of the hill I used one piece under the buildings, the next structure up the hill had two pieces under it, and the top structures had three pieces under it. So the top structures would raise above the street level by about three quarters of an inch. To get the right road configuration, I used pieces of cardboard that were the correct width. These were taped together to create a zigzag shape. I think a zigzag road is more interesting than having a straight road. Before the rear structures were set in place, these are the structures that the road will rise to meet. I wrapped the structures in saran wrap to protect them from the moisture 
in the road material. I set the buildings in place and then I sculpted the road up to and around the structures. I let the road dry and then removed the structures from the scenery and then removed the saran wrap from them. And what I've done, I've made a, a little mold in the road where the structures sit back in place perfectly. The step before road construction was to drill holes in the display for LED wires. Run the wires through the holes, test the lights, and then glue the structures in place. To keep the buildings flat and level in the scenery, I placed weights on top of them until the glue dried. These little weights on the back of the blacksmith shop are called turtles. They were used in the dark room to make borderless prints years ago. They also make great weights that can be hung on a roof to hold the rear of a structure down. I sealed the road area with dabs of leftover scenery paint. That's why it's all different colors right now. And what these did, they just filled in any cracks and seal any texture that was around the road surface. The next step was to actually add the road. And the road material was made from Red Devil lightweight spackle, which I thinned a little bit with water, and then I added a terracotta colored rock powder. This was a fairly loose mix that I could trowel on and then use a wet brush to shape the road and to fill the uphill area in the rear. As the spackle started to set, I smoothed the surface with a wet brush, working the road up to and around each structure to give them a settled look. I brushed weathering powder down the road after the spackle had dried and the powder added texture and it added little signs of wear and tear around the porch buildings and around the steps. This was the way the road looked when the display was finished. I glued many small pieces of foam and grass around the building. The next step before the bridges were installed was to paint the water base. This was done using the four acrylic colors black, white, cerulean blue, and a medium green. And if you look at my other video here on YouTube called Building Waterways, you'll see me doing this process. These colors were dabbed onto the water surface using the action of the brush to mix them together. This is a standard water technique that I demonstrate in my video. Here's a shot showing the road area at the top of the hill and how it rises to meet the structures. But mostly this shot is about the stream with the acrylic gloss varnish water poured in. On the other side of the display, I wanted a small waterfall. I arranged the rocks so the water has to tumble over them. Here is acrylic varnish and Mod Podge in the stream getting ready to dry. When it dries, it'll be fairly clear. Now let's move on to the structures. You know, long before the display was started, I built the structures. I always have a large inventory of small buildings that can be adapted, but I also needed several signature structures that looked like the ones in the Fallberg cartoons. The structures were made from kits and semi-scratch built. The first was the blacksmith shop. This was a kit from Bill Banter at Banter Model Works. I modified the roof using Paper Creek tar paper and I added interior detail. The blacksmith interior was assembled from details in my junk box. I made the hearth from wood, paper, and N-gauge coal. The workbench is from fine scale miniatures the barrels, boxes, and other details came from SS Limited. And there's a red LED in the hearth that glows. Another Banta kit was called Clark's Outpost. And I added a Wild West shake shingle roof and the front porch. It has detail inside that can be seen through the door. The station is from Woodland Scenics. It's cast metal. I added the platform. I tried to scratch build a station using the Fiddletown cartoon book as a reference, but gave up when it didn't look right. 
The smaller scratch structures were made from an assortment of laser cut pieces from Atlantic scale models. These were destined to be fishermen shacks on another project, but were changed a bit to look like old miners buildings and sheds. I've made over a dozen of these types of buildings and I used a few on this project. The water tank is a plastic Atlas tank. I scratch built the wood supports underneath it and resurfaced the roof. Here's the roof of the tank. I took Wild West shake shingles and made them less shaky using scissors. These were glued over the Atlas plastic roof. The boarding house is a banter kit, only slightly modified. Here it is without the roof to try out the LED placement. Most of the structures were illuminated using the microlumina LEDs and current limiters. When possible, I added interior detail if it could be seen through a door or window. I found carpeting and scale wallpaper online by looking up free dollhouse decorations. I modified the carpets and wallpaper in Photoshop to get them to about HO scale. The furniture was from SS Limited. The ceiling of the bedroom has a mirror, just like a real bordello. And what it does, it doubles the intensity of the LED and makes it inside look a lot brighter. Here's the forge in the blacksmith shop. The current limiter allowed me to power all the lights, the whole display, on one 12 volt wall transformer. I needed several tents for the miners to live in while they prospected for gold. And I built a bunch of cardboard frames. These were eight feet by eight feet by four feet high at the knee wall in HO scale. These are not precision models as you can see, but these little cardboard huts will be covered with canvas so they're good enough. I smeared the frames with white glue and placed on the canvas. I wanted sheer canvas so lantern light in each tent would shine through. Bill Bantha supplies roofing paper with some of his kits. It's meant to be used as model tar paper. It's thin but has a little see-through texture. I thought it might make a good tent canvas. And I wanted the old-fashioned type that had the rough feel of Levi jeans. I remember the canvas being gray to tan color and always smelled of tar-like waterproofing. I had flashbacks to my uncomfortable Boy Scout days trying to sleep in one of these tents while it was raining. You'd have a wet sleeping bag for a week. I took Banta's roofing paper, laid it out on a towel, and applied a thin wash of earth and black. After it dried, I had my canvas, as you can see here. I draped the canvas over the cardboard frame and held everything in place using white glue. After the white glue dried, I folded back the front curtains and placed a bed and an LED in each tent. In this early morning scene, you can see where I placed the two tents on the display. They're in the background. Normally a miner would set these up on a vacant lot or any place that was flat. About this time in the construction process, I ballasted the track. I used a dark gray stone ballast and held it in place with the loop mat medium. When the glue had dried, I removed any ballast on the ties and then weathered everything with a thin black wash that aged between the rails and another wash of burnt sienna to weather outside the rails. The two lower small bridges and the trestle on the other side of this display were made from leftover scrap box odds and ends and parts from a plastic trestle kit. The fourth bridge, this one on the top, posed an engineering dilemma. It seems that one part of the top track ran directly over the bottom track. What I needed to do was build a bridge that was self-supporting without supports going down and interfering with the bottom track. So I decided after several failures to build a deck truss bridge. 
While looking around in my workshop, I spotted a piece of small plastic plate girder that came from some type of coal loader kit, probably over 50 years old. I made an RTV rubber mold of the girder section and cast a dozen or so resin girders. Because the girder sections were so thin, I had several rejects, but I culled out the good pieces and primed them with gray auto primer. These were assembled off the display on a paper template. After several trial fits, I spray painted the bridge with Krylon Camo Black, let it dry and glued it in place. Under the center of the bridge, I made a stone support column from pink styrofoam that I carved and colored to match the retaining walls. Here's the finished column being glued in place. I left the weight on the bridge overnight while the glue dried to keep everything square and level. You can see the coach on the bottom track has just enough room to pass under. Here's one of the little bridges I made from scrap box wood. I slid it under the rails and glued it in place using super glue. The bridge was added rather early in the scenery construction. Here's the plastic trestle, built from pieces of an old plastic trestle kit. I reduced the height of the bents and added wooden cross members for support. To wire the display, I turned it on its side and clamped the edge to the table to hold it steady. After looking at it for a while, I knew I was flirting with death. With my luck, the whole thing would go crashing to the floor. So, I took a squeeze clamp and attached a piece of grip chain to it. And then I wired a C-clamp to the other end of the chain. The C-clamp went on the edge of the display and the welder's clamp was attached to the ceiling. It worked and gave me a little more peace of mind while I wired it. All the wires were color-coded and went to terminals. All connections were soldered. When I attached the power supply, everything worked. Let's talk about making the hats. I bought some Prizer Western themed figures and modified other figures to look Western. Besides repainting several figures, the biggest modification was adding little cowboy hats. My first plan was to cut a head with a hat on it from a figure and make a mold and cast it to make a lot of little heads with cowboy hats on them that could be glued to the HO bodies. Of course, I immediately dropped the head on the floor and could never find it, so that option was out. The next hat making adventure, the one that worked, was to punch out little circles from colored paper, put an X-shaped cut in the middle, and push them over the figure's head. A drop of yellow glue held the hat in place and made a little bump for the crown. When the glue dried, I painted the hats and modified the brims so they didn't look like Chinese coolie hats. Here's a homemade hat on the figure in the foreground. Here's another homemade hat on the guy riding the horse, the equestrian figure. A top view of the back side of the town with all of the figures in place. Last and most important step was to run the trains. One mini train engine and four cars went around the display for over 42 hours nonstop. They were connected to the mini train's controller and it keeps them running at a realistic speed. I told Andreas, the manufacturer, what I'd done and he said I might have worn out the engine. I checked it, added a little lubrication, and ran it for another eight hours without a problem. I still run the train on my little HON30 sugarcane layout without any problems. Finally, narrow gauge modelers, especially HON30 modelers, have affordable engines that run great out of the box. 
I hope these little engines spark another HON30 revival. The week before Christmas 2014, I built a crate and shipped the project to Germany. It was used at the Nuremberg Toy Fair in January 2015 to show off the Mini Trains line of cars and engines. And that's it. I'm Dave Frary. See you on the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.